we've done before, if you have questions, please write them on the cards provided. And right after the, the lecture, they'll be collected by the ushers and uh, will be fielded by our participants here. Now, it won't be possible for them to answer all the questions. At least that's what we anticipate. So the questions that aren't covered in the question answer period will be uh, saved and uh, handed to the participants at the 3.30 final closing panel. Also, there are some students and others who have to, uh, may have to leave. So right after the lecture proper, uh, we'll have a, a short recess for people to uh, get in and out of this crowded place. Um, to do justice to Dr. Seaborg, in an introduction, it'd have to be very long. Uh, fortunately, he was an originator of the idea of this Nobel conference, and he's been our most consistent participant over the years. So most everyone knows him. Um, he's so well known, I think, that I can uh, condense the the uh, introduction quite a bit. Uh, it would be rather difficult anyway to really do justice to a person who has either been the discoverer or the co-discoverer of nine of the 13 transuranium elements. He's identified and characterized over 100 new isotopes. He's published over 200 papers. That's a job for anyone to read. And uh, uh, written 12 books. And he's served by appointment under five US presidents as the foremost authority in nuclear energy since 1961 when President Kennedy appointed him of the Atomic Energy Commission. He's been reappointed. He's uh, been chancellor of the University of California in Berkeley. He was head of the University of Chicago Metallurgical Laboratories during the World War II. Uh, am I embarrassing him? No. <laughs> uh, as part of the Manhattan Project. Uh, and those of you who are chemistry students, uh, at one time or another, probably had, had an introduction to the chemical study program. Well, he was uh, instrumental in initiating this program in 1959 and uh, has been on their uh, steering committee ever since. And by my count, which is quite inaccurate, I'm sure, he has, he's serving right now on at least eight advisory boards and more than a dozen US and international learned societies. And these are just a few of his extraordinary accomplishments. Uh, to top this all off, he has a wife and, and six children. <laughs> anyway, Dr. Seaborg, we're very anxious to hear about how science and, can, and technology can best assist us in shaping the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Langshan. What I was doing when you introduced me as a former chancellor of uh, the University of California at Berkeley uh, was indicating uh, some uh, concern. And I was sort of hoping that you would have mentioned that I left that position voluntarily. <laughs> <laughs> as Dr. Langshan has indicated, uh, I've had the pleasure of being connected uh, with these Nobel conferences uh, from the beginning. And I've uh, uh, found them uh, very interesting. And I'm very glad to have been invited to speak again this year. It's a pleasure to return for another of your outstanding conferences. In the past, these conferences have discussed such topics as the genetics and the future of man, the uniqueness of man, communication, and creativity. And this year, you have chosen to cover the very broad topic, shaping the future, and you have selected a distinguished group of futurists to discuss its many aspects. Now, for my own contribution, I've decided to speak on the subject shaping the future through science and technology. And I've chosen this approach for several reasons. One is that this conference is conducted in, on for, in honor of Alfred Nobel, a man who had great faith in science and technology as the means of molding the future for a better life.
for all men. Now, Nobel had a particularly difficult time uh, justifying and fostering this idea because uh, similar to the situation that we face today with the Atomic Energy Commission, he personally was struggling to develop and then distribute for beneficial uses a form of power that was introduced destructively and bore the stigma of death. Now, another reason I've chosen to speak on shaping the future through science and technology is that we have many people today who doubt that this can or will be done, and some who even doubt that we have much of a future to look forward to, much less to shape. Times have certainly changed since Winston Churchill said, if the human, if the human race wishes to have a prolonged and indefinite period of material prosperity, they have only got to behave in a peaceful and helpful way towards one another, and science will do for them all that they wish and more than they can dream. Now today, Sir Winston's faith in science would be looked upon as incredibly naive. And there would be some who would even go further and claim that it is exactly this kind of thinking that got us where we are today. But I'd like to take issue with this. Just where are we today? What has been the role of science and technology in getting us there, and what will be its role in the future? We face some very negative opinions today about science and technology in particular, and about man in general, and about their relationships. Broadly speaking, we're told that man is a failure and that science and technology are responsible. This attitude is expressed in many ways by many groups and individuals. There are the bands of disenchanted youths uh, who go off to reject modern society. There are those groups who, not having gone so far as rejecting all of society, reject all of science and technology on the grounds that some of it serves military, social, or political causes with which they do not agree. And yet many of these are the very same groups that clamor for the uplifting of the people of developing countries, admitting that science and technology must play a role in their advances. And there are those groups and individuals who are just as unilateral in their critiques of science and technology from other standpoints, some claiming they are leading us toward irreversible ecological destruction, others saying that they are the source of alienation that, de that deprives us of our humanity, and still others seeing them as forces separating us from a biological inheritance that we should retain. Yet all of these will agree, after some reflection, that science and technology have contributed to our humanity, are needed to deal constructively with ecological problems, and could be directed to establish a healthy relationship between man and his environment. There's a strange mixture of tragedy and truth in all these outlooks, and unfortunately a strange distortion of past history and present reality also. Contrary to many romantic notions that abound today, nature alone could not support the billions of people on Earth now and the billions that are going to be due in the future, even with population control. Should this be even partially attempted, every hardship that man has suffered in the past would be visited upon him many fold, and nature and man would be devastated in constant conflict with each other, and we would see eventually, rather than the communal spirit projected by the young idealists, an aggressiveness and vicious competitiveness the like of which history has never revealed. If you don't believe me, try projecting what the world would be like as each of the benefits of modern science and technology were removed, and then all the people of the world were asked to retreat further and further into those supposedly ideal and idyllic yesteryears when men lived closer to nature. Now, contrary to much that is heard today, science and technology, I believe, are not unnatural or anti-nature nor are they aberrations of human development that will lead to man's downfall. Anyone who merely compiles their errors and their human misuses 
in a one-sided picture uh, to condemn and dismiss them as that is totally lacking in vision. If man were to pursue the illusion that he could adjust to nature without a constant upgrading of his science and technology, he would soon be extinct. Those who would depend for survival strictly on nature's ecological balance, devoid of man's intellectual equalizers, would witness the rapid decline of man and the ascendancy of another species, most likely the insect, even perhaps the lowly cockroach, who we are told has survived for millions of years and is still growing strong. But in stating my case in defending science and technology from this broad standpoint, I decidedly do not want to give the impression that I believe science and technology, as used by human beings, are unmitigated good, that all the criticism of them today is invalid or undeserved, or that much good may not result from the values of our youth's counterculture on our science culture. Feedback from such a counterculture is absorbed, and the best of it will have a good and lasting effect on our society. It simply is not true that our scientific technological civilization is unresponsive to or destructive of our humanity. In total, it is a very human and humane enterprise that is guided by human drives and that tends to elevate, not debase, those drives. And let me dwell on another aspect of this point for a moment. If it seems we are being told from all sides today that man is a failure, it is, ironically enough, because we are being judged in terms of a whole new set of values in a world where almost everything seems possible, and now almost every want every injustice and every wrong seems unbearable. Alexis de Tocqueville anticipated this over a century ago when he said, the evil which was suffered patiently as inevitable seems unendurable as soon as the idea of escaping from it crosses men's minds. This holds true with a vengeance today. And I do not say that we should not maintain that impatience as long as it drives us to act and act constructively. In fact, Victor Hugo made a very cogent statement on the constructive use of this impatience when he said, good government consists of knowing how much of the future to introduce into the present. There is no doubt now that science and technology have made this as government increasingly difficult. But because we can make instant coffee does not mean that we can achieve instant population control. Neither can we throw our environment into a washing machine, nor can we, like uh, a response to a cry for demand feeding, alter the relationship between our technological and economic systems overnight. And certainly achieving the single goal of placing a man on the moon, no matter how impressive a scientific and in engineering achievement is not to be compared with an ability to raise the quality of life for 200 million people. The important thing to remember is that the combination of this impatience, those values brought on by our new awareness of conditions as measured against potentials, and the knowledge and power that science and technology can provide represents a force that could truly elevate man. Now at this point I must stress our new awareness of our environmental and human condition because it is the basis of a whole new era of scientific and technological, social and political action ahead and because it is actually quite remarkable. For example, there's a little bookstore just across the street from the Washington office of the Atomic Energy uh, Commission. And in this store they have com compiled a reading list uh, which is growing, expanding all the time in ecology and related subjects for their customers. And there are now 260 books, most of which were published within the last two or three years. And these are the books just stocked by this little store on ecology and the environment. And these are only books, the profusion of technical journals, newspaper and magazine articles, and television 
and radio programs related to these subjects now has reached the proportions of a torrent of information and a rightful expression of concern. Now let me make one further point on this new awareness. It seems to me that among other things, civilization progresses through our use of a combination of hindsight, insight, and foresight, with our advances depending largely on the extent to which we can emphasize the latter two. A review of all the popular material on environmental and social problems today shows that at the moment we are still heavy on hindsight, although there is much good insight coming through now. The result is that we are still spending too much time and effort in seeking out scapegoats for today's ills and making historical comparisons which are unproductive and invalid. In this same vein, we have many people who see the past and present through a strange pair of glasses, one that filters out our human advances as they approach the present and highlights only the glories of the past, giving the impression that the total condition of man is regressing. And in my view, nothing could be further from the truth. All our environmental problems not, notwithstanding. Now, I won't dwell on this subject today, but instead I urge anyone who doubts our accomplishments and our potentials to read a remarkable book, Optimism One, The Emerging Radicalism by F. M. Esfendiari. He was born in Iran and lived many, uh, in, in many parts of the world, uh, worked for the United Nations, and now lives and teaches in this country. And he attacks the entire mythology generated by today's cynics. His ruthlessly realistic appraisal of days past and uh, of how those in the underdeveloped areas of the world live, and they're still essentially living in the past, as compared with the conditions, care, and compassion of the modern world is indeed impressive. He speaks of our relationship with nature, of social conditions of the old world, of identity, alienation, and violence, and he speaks as one who has lived in both past and present. If we want to shape the future, and particularly through science and technology, we must get out of the traps created by the despair of today's cynics or the frustration generated by unrealistic expectations. Neither condition allows us to develop the proper insight and move on to applying the necessary foresight which is so important today. How then shall we move ahead? What should we expect from science and technology? What needs to be done to use them to the best advantage? And if this is done, where might they take us? In other words, what will be the shape of the future that they might provide? Now, the answer, answer to these questions, we must explore in arriving at it a basic dilemma of our times. That dilemma stated over simply is, how can we have the growth to meet expectations already generated, global expectations that seem to make virtually unlimited demands in a world of physical limitations, many of which are already being approached. The immediate reaction to this, and it is one shared by many people today, is to stop the growth or to be more explicit, limit population, reduce expectations, lower production and pollution, and concentrate on the redistribution of material things and the quality of life. Now this is a very natural, uh, rational, and human reaction. But unfortunately, taken as a single prescription, it is neither a very realistic nor imaginative one, and I'd like to try to explain that. Man, since his earliest days, has always played what is known as the zero-sum game. In a limited environment, limits enforced by physical, social, or political barriers, or boundaries, or by his own ignorance, he has had to compete or share a limited amount of resources. But as he grew in his ability to manipulate his environment through knowledge and tools which gave him advantages, both destructive and productive, he was able to expand the sum to be divided and extend himself to new limitations. Through history, the ages of exploration, of industrialization, 
of scientific revolution, he was able to expand both his frontiers and uh, his expectations. During such growth, the impression was gained that he was no longer playing that zero-sum game. But because different costs, human hardships, and environmental changes were not accounted for. But it should also be noted that each major expansion, each increase of the sum, was made possible by a major advance in knowledge, in technology, and in a new resolution of the human will to support it. Today we have reached the end of another era of expansion, and the, in the eyes of many, it is an end that is final and discouraging. Surveying population growth, resources depletion, environmental pollution and limitations, and man's general social conditions, these people tend to say, the jig is up. We have reached the end of the line. There is only one, to, one way to go, freeze further growth and work within the limitations of this new zero sum, this spaceship Earth, which our new perspective allows us to see in a new light. When contrasted with the major feelings of only a few short years ago, that the sky was the limit, that economic growth was synonymous with progress, and that both were essentially limitless, the new attitude I just mentioned seems far more sane. And I agree that if it were simply an either-or proposition, I would immediately side with those who opt for the freeze. For the natural limitations, physical and otherwise, of uncontrolled growth are obvious. And rather than blindly moving ahead into their devastating effects, rather than letting natural laws put a harsh stop to our growth, we would be better off imposing our own limits harsh as they might also seem to some. But in my view, we are not faced with a strictly either or proposition. Economic growth and ecological balances are not necessarily incompatible. There are areas where new growth and development are essential, and there are those in which they should be leveled off or even cut back, of course. There is also a new morality being introduced into the marketplace that will allow economic values to be assigned to environmental necessities so that through a combination of regulations and incentives we can enjoy a type of human advancement neither tied only to a rising GNP nor bound to a harsh zero growth policy. The key to this middle way, however, lies mainly in the wise development and, in my opinion, application of science and technology. With our global frontiers seemingly closed, they hold the secrets to widening those frontiers, to radically expanding the new zero sum to which we seemed to be confined. Before explaining how they might do this, let me clarify what kind of growth I am talking about and why we must pursue further, any further expansion that we might look forward to in a rational way. The idea of zero growth is, surprisingly enough, one that appeals most to the educated, middle-class American for a combination of reasons, one of which might be his own feelings of guilt as he surveys his own abundance and environmental impact against the problems of the day. This citizen feels we must change our direction. He is sincere in his concern and willing, but probably only to a point, to make sacrifices to right the wrongs that have never, that have been per perpetrated in the acquisition of his affluent society. But what he does not realize is that for all its size and impact, if it were impossible to distribute today, if it uh, should be possible rather, uh, today to distribute our wealth evenly among the four billion people of the world, it would not go very far in meeting the needs and expectations that exist, and not to include those of the future already uh, born. And simply to compare the income and environmental effects of the average American and the citizen of a developing nation, and use that as a guide to future action, makes little sense either. To the hungry and the poverty-stricken, ecology is irrelevant. 
Not having social security or much other security, they breed for survival to assure the perpetuation of their people and to have the necessary support should they survive to old age. So that while important programs of population control have been moderately successful, they struggle against a natural instinct that could be adjusted by greater development, development that can take place through advances of science and technology without further environmental degradation and within some kind of rational economic framework. The advance of the so-called green revolution, the creation and distribution of new high yield crops as supported by the Rockefeller and Ford foundations and carried out by such men as um, our speaker at this conference, Nobel laureate Norman Borlaug, is an example of the kind of development I have in mind. Of course, the ability to lift a people above a marginal existence to a position where they have the strength and will to further advance must be supplemented by other means of development. Energy, education, improved transportation, and communication systems and appropriate industry must be brought in. But not in the way that they were inter introduced into today's advanced nations. For then they would repeat and compound many fold the environmental and social problems those nations face. And here is where advances in science and technology and their application can make all the difference, can shape a new future rather than disastrously disastrously imitate the past. There is no need for today's developing nations to relive the trials of a 19th century type industrial revolution and arrive at many of the technologically induced dilemmas of the 20th century. All these pitfalls can be avoided if a truly rational approach to development is used and with such an approach the average citizen of a developing nation can arrive at a living standard satisfactory to him in tune with his culture and lifestyle and not destructive of his environment. It does not have to follow, as some would have us believe, that because the middle class American has 50 times the environmental impact of a peasant in India, that an Indian cannot achieve a life of material well-being and dignity without a compar uh, comparable impact. Now to understand how this is possible, we might look at the other side of the coin and see how the advanced nations might be redeveloped through new outlooks of science and technology. The reason why science and technology have paradoxically been both a success and a failure, why they have created the progress, ex expectations, and problems they have is because they and their applications have been developed and adopted in a piecemeal fashion within a market economy. Until most recently in our scientific age, we did not have the benefit of ecological or systems thinking. Nor with expanding physical frontiers did we appear to have the need or the desire for them. Specialization seemed to gain the most productive results. Everything invented or developed was used to the limits of its profitability with its negative impact absorbed or written off if noticed at all. And so we moved into what Simon Ramo has called the century of mismatch, with unplanned or ill-planned growth, institutions incapable of understanding or directing that growth, and leading to our current era when new limits, new interfaces, and all sorts of discontinuities have suddenly seemed to hit us just as we thought we had the good life really made. As I pointed out before, today we have a great awareness of this situation and from this awareness, a new set of truths is emerging and new guidelines for the course of society are being written. Now, one of these truths is that future development cannot come about through the direct exploitation of nature or man. It must be the result of using the capital of growing knowledge, of rethinking our values and revising our priorities, of learning to do more with less by increasing efficiency, by the maximum recycling of resources, by being more imaginative and less restricted by tradition and design, by learning to manage the greater complexity that is involved in the systems thinking and action we must employ today. The need for the systems approach, the ecological approach, is an important truth in itself. 
If we look around us, we see that almost all the problems of our age are problems at new interfaces or that take place because of a lack of, in of integration between related forces, both mechanical and human. For example, we no longer have merely a highway system, a railway system, and an airway system. We have a total transportation system in which each of these components must flow together. If one ceases to function or becomes overloaded, the backup immediately affects or even cripples the others. If we look one step beyond this, we can see that if our energy system or any portion of it fails, our transportation system is imperiled, our communications are affected, our health, our health is endangered by the failure of other services and so on in a chain reaction. Similar critical relationships exist between the chain of resources, production, and waste, and at the man-machine man interface as the role of man continues to shift from production to services. In other words, modern civilization has an ecology of its own and maintaining its balances as well as the smooth functioning of its, part, of its parts is now absolutely essential. The human aspects of this ecology provide other examples of why discontinuities and mismatches must be, must be adjusted. In a world witnessing an explosion of people and human activity, at the same time that an implosion of these through urbanization and other forced contacts has taken place, enormous potential for conflict is generated at all points where there are disparities. These disparities may be harsh physical and economic differences. They may be differences in education and opportunity. They may also be psychological and cultural differences. And today, on both a global and national scale, we are seeing violent reactions to these differences in the form of rising nationalism, intensified racial strife, and increased conflict over ideological differences. The resulting turmoil caused by these polarizations cannot be wished or talked away. It cannot be ameliorated by retreating to irrationality or mysticism. It cannot be reduced by rationalizing that, that science and technology are responsible for it and therefore should not be allowed to interfere further or the opposite that they alone should be responsible for correcting a situation they produce. The solutions I see in resolving all these related problems of our age lie in recognizing fully both the organic nature of human civilization today and its inherent relationship with the natural environment that supports it. <clears throat> they lie in recognizing that science and technology, the major forces behind the growth and intensification of these relationships, must be used to gain the knowledge we need to fill the important gaps in our physical and social intelligence and to adjust our discontinuities and coordinate are mismatched relationships. They lie in building the social institutions and perhaps restructuring some of our existing ones to direct science and technology wisely, just as those institutions must extract intelligence and a certain wisdom from science and technology. Actually, we are struggling with these solutions today, or at least we're beginning to. They seem so complex, so overwhelming at times, that we wonder if we are not losing that race between education and catastrophe that we hear so much about. But I think we have at hand and are developing certain tools to help us win it. And some of these have arrived on the scene, historically speaking, virtually in the nick of time. Now, I've often spoke of nuclear energy in this context because I believe that if we pursue, pursue its development carefully and apply it wisely, it will provide a reasonably controlled population of reasonable demands with a virtually inexhaustible supply of power and at a time when we can anticipate the depletion of other sources of power. I emphasized the reasonable population size and its reasonable demands because there are those who upon hearing of inexhaustible energy blanch at the idea that it will, it will only be used to support catastrophic growth. But if after all that we are learning these days, we still believe that any technology will be used to its ridiculous extremes or to support other obviously dangerous excesses simply because it is there or is temporarily profitable, then we face the greatest danger of all. 
literally that of lacking the collective intelligence or will to adapt to our own evolution. I refuse to believe that we are suicidal. I do not think that we will go that route. Nuclear energy used wisely will free man from eons of from what Kenneth Boulding calls the entropy trap. Abundant energy will allow us to save nature, not destroy it, by making a recycle civilization possible. In such a civilization, only energy will be depleted, and natural resources, as we advance further in our knowledge of chemistry and physics, will become the building blocks of a world in which there can be endless variety without destruction. In such a civilization, we can expand the zero sum so that all men can enjoy freedom from want, learn the true meaning of security, and live in dignity with their fellow man. Here are the real challenges to help us build a world that can retain its natural beauty and be an endless source of human creativity. Now there's another technology that is much maligned, but which I actually believe is coming to the rescue of mankind. And in fact, that may make mankind possible, and that is the computer. As the British cybernetics expert, Professor Stafford Beer has pointed out, society has become a complex organism and it needs a nervous system. We are now a global civilization that depends for its survival on a growing influx of data, which must be processed into information and stored and distributed and eventually upgraded to knowledge and wisdom. Today, the computer is the vital link in that system. And in addition to telling us where we are, it can help us to shape our future by giving us the means to project and examine alternate futures. Through computer models, we can look ahead to the consequences of various courses of action that we may choose, and thus we may be in a position to choose more wisely. Now, there are other sciences and technologies that offer great promise for the future. The Earth orbiting satellite is one of these. Equipped in various ways, it has the potential of giving us long-term accurate weather forecasting that may save many lives and much property. It can give us vital information concerning environmental conditions, the health of crops, the state of the oceans, the atmosphere, the location of mineral resources, and other national, natural phenomena. And it can unite the world through satellite communications, providing education and a means of sharing knowledge and culture. Perhaps the most significant shaping of the future may yet come from the shaping of man himself directly from the great advances now anticipated in the biological sciences. And here again, and perhaps most forcefully, we are faced with the moral challenge that science and technology create. When life itself can be directly controlled, molded, and synthesized from basic chemicals, who will determine the nature, the direction, and the ends of that life? Are we preparing ourselves for such godlike responsibility? In terms of cosmic time, we are approaching it almost at the speed of light. We must think and plan and work and build our social institutions to manage this and other great responsibilities that our evolution is thrusting upon us, and we must do it now. Now, in conclusion, I'm pleased that this conference has chosen to discuss shaping the future. It uh, must be obvious to all of us how important this is. It expresses, in spite of all the despair around us today, an affirmation in that future, a belief that we have a future and that if we will will it, we can be masters of that future, not its victims. Today I have expressed the belief that science and technology are essential to the shaping of that future. I hope we will turn to them with a growing care and dedication and use them with increasing wisdom. And if we do, perhaps Sir Winston will not have been wrong and they will provide the human race with all that they wish and more than they can dream. Thank you very much.
Since this is uh, most of the questions given to the panel right now are for Dr. Seaborg, I'd like to just let him him uh, field a few of them. He hasn't had a chance to look them over, but uh, he can take them off the top of the pile or something. Shall I? Well, I haven't, as you say, had a chance to look them over. I'll take them, I guess, in order then. I hope that I'll get some help from my fellow panelists because uh, there's a wide range of questions here. Uh, the first one is, what are the new developments for controlling plasma for an energy source? Uh, the type of uh, nuclear power that we have today depends on uh, the fission reaction, as you know. It uses uh, as fuel fissionable materials, uranium-235 and, and plutonium. And uh, with uh, uh, the fission reaction, because it is induced by a neutron and eight more neutrons are given off in each reaction, it can be perpetuated by neutrons. A neutron strikes a nucleus, there are more neutrons, they strike more nuclei, and this goes on until you get a million, billion, billion uh, nuclei undergoing fission or something like that. And the heat energy from that can be controlled and turned into electricity by ordinary conventional means, and you get your energy. Now, in the fusion reaction, you have another uh, principle involved, which makes it uh, uh, so difficult technically, but possible in theory. You don't have a neutron uh, uh, to perpetuate the reaction. You have charged nuclei, light nuclei, at the opposite end of the scale coming together, building up heavier nuclei, a hydrogen and a hydrogen coming together to, uh, to uh, produce helium, also giving off energy. See, at the top of the scale, if you split a nucleus and fission into two lighter products, say half the uh, weight of the initial, uh, initial fissionable nucleus, you get energy. At the bottom of the scale, if you fuse two nuclei together uh, to get the sum, you get energy. At the top of the scale, a neutron can uh, uh, cause that reaction. At the bottom of the scale, there is no analogous neutron. The nuclei have to fuse together, and that uh, means they have their electric uh, repulsion and therefore you have to raise them to a high temperature, and man has to do that. He has to heat those nuclei in a plasma to hundreds of millions of degrees so that they can fuse together. And in such quantity, and over such periods of time, that you get more energy out of it than you uh, put into it. This is the way the sun and the stars uh, produce their energy. In that case, uh, the reaction got started somehow. The whole mass was heated, and it goes on for eons, for billions of years, the fusion reaction. And it's held together by gravitational attraction. Now, what man has to do is reproduce a miniature sun in the laboratory. And uh, he doesn't have the advantage of gravitational attraction because he doesn't have that large a mass, nothing analogous to it. So he has to figure a way of containing it. Now, as I mentioned to you, this has to operate at hundreds of millions of degrees. So at the beginning, you see, you have a very difficult <coughs> container problem. And this is solved through plasma physics. The, the, the material is heated to high temperatures. The electrons are stripped off so that electric and magnetic fields can get a hold of them, can uh, exert forces. And attempts are made to devise a machine where this plasma stays away from the walls of the machine confined by magnetic fields. And then attempts are made to heat the plasma to hundreds of millions of degrees for times long enough and at concentrations high enough so that more energy is extracted than you put into it in order to heat uh, the material and uh, produce these magnetic fields. This is a very difficult problem, and uh, we have a great deal of work going on in this country and in Europe, and particularly in the Soviet Union. They're putting more effort into it than any country, including the United States. And we have reached the point where we nearly know how to do it. We have reached the point that is 
nearly equivalent to where we were on December 2nd, 1942 at Stagg Field in Chicago when the first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction uh, was successfully produced by Enrico Fermi. Following the December 2nd, 1942 breakthrough, it took, as you know, some 20 or 25 years to produce usable, economic, safe nuclear fission power of the type that uh, we are using today. We don't know whether it'll take that long after we solve the basic problems of obtaining uh, a controlled fusion reaction. As I say, we haven't quite reached that stage, but if we reach that within the next five or ten years, then it may take another if it's analogous to the fission reaction, another 20 or 25 years. So most of us estimate that by the year 2000, we probably will have large economic control fusion reactors. If we do, we have energy that will last essentially forever, millions of years, longer than that, because then we will be literally burning the hydrogen of the sea. In fact, we would have the equivalent on Earth of about 50, no, 500 Pacific Oceans full of high-grade fuel oil, if we reach that point. We'd be burning the heavy hydrogen, the deuterium, in the water of the seas. And that's what they, people mean when they say burning the rocks and the, and the water in the sea. Burning the rocks means burning the very small amount of uranium, in granite in breeder reactors, and burning the sea means burning the deuterium or heavy hydrogen in the ocean. How long will it be until breeder reactors can be used? And with these, how long will they be able to provide a main source of energy for society? We expect to have our first uh, large economical, low production, uh, reproduction time breeder operating in the middle 19. 80s, and uh, if that breeder can be perfected, and I think it can, that will use the uranium on Earth so efficiently that uh, the fuel, the uranium fuel, and thorium is another form of breeder, thorium fuel would last for thousands of years. <clears throat> With all the books and movies on computers, for example, 2001, A Space Odyssey, and 1984, do you think this has influenced the American people for or against computers already? Well, I've talked a long time on the first one. Uh, who wants to try this one, Mr. Wiener or Mr. McHale? Either way. Go ahead. I think with any kind of machine, you're talking about computers, this question of do you want to control it? Do you want to control it, you have to understand it. You know, that's one of the first kind of basic principles. And I think a lot of the fear and pessimism about the possibility of a computer-controlled society simply occurs from lack of understanding of some of the basic principles of computers. And generally speaking, they operate on what is put into the machine. People who control the machines are the programmers. Certainly, you could have a situation where if the programmers themselves became under control of some elite then you could control large segments of society in terms of the kinds of massive records that are compiled by, on individuals in large data banks. But it still remains you know, within individual and collective control, human control. I don't there's any kind of nonsense here about machines taking over. Does anyone disagree with that? Can I, I, sure I, I, disagree? I do disagree with that, yes. Good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I put it deliberately that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, all these things, uh, fire, dynamite, um, fission, fusion, computers, are all good servants uh, and can uh, certainly are bad masters and can get out of hand in spite of the, uh, the efforts of, uh, of many of the people involved. And it isn't, um, I, I wouldn't be so um, uh, confident that computers don't have uh, some dangerous consequences uh, in spite of the fact that it is true that you don't get more out of them than you put in them in, in one sense. But in another sense, you do, because you change the way you do things as a result of making computers part of the system with which you do things. 
I spoke about this last night in the in the uh, in the small group. You change the meaning of membership in the community because you change the way in which information about individuals is kept in that community, uh, and that doesn't take any more out of it than you put into it. But it makes a big difference, and things are not as they were before after the computers are there. You also build more and more complex and highly integrated systems, which are vulnerable to uh, accidental breakdown or even to uh, sabotage other kinds of destruction with immense social consequences. As the society is more highly integrated, as it depends more and more on these complex systems, we have things like the Eastern power grid failure. Uh, we can have, in effect, command and control failures on a very large scale involving very large parts of the society, let's say the financial system and so forth, as it becomes more and more computerized and highly integrated. Uh, here again, we're not talking about uh, a genie getting out of a bottle. We're talking about the fact that as we use things, we pay certain prices, and it can turn out that we pay a higher price than we anticipated, particularly if things go wrong. And the moral of these considerations is not that we shouldn't use computers, far from it. Computers are extraordinarily valuable. They, will, they have already freed people from a good deal of routine hack work of various kinds. Uh, they'll do a great deal for us, but um, it would be a great mistake to relax our vigilance about the potential social consequences of dependency on these things on the ground that um, you know, they can't do any more than we've asked them to do, or we can always pull the plug, or some such notion. Uh, after you're dependent on them, you can't pull the plug, not without paying a very heavy price. And it, it's that situation that one ought to be concerned about. All right, next question. Don't you think that since we have achieved so much materially that we should spread it to other nations? Uh, oh, yeah. Don't you think that since we have achieved so much materially that we should spread it to other nations instead of consuming it all ourselves? Otherwise, what is the purpose of achieving prosperity? Uh, Dr. Borlaug, do you want to try that one? Well, if we uh, look at this from the context of uh, food, from the short time standpoint in times of emergency, uh, certainly I think that the wealthy nations of the world must continue to, to assist the developing nations of the world. But the long-time solution is not that. There must be development within those de uh, emerging countries. And we must help them develop. Well, I think we have a moral obligation for the time being through various types of aid and perhaps uh, much of it channeled through international organizations, but also by bilateral assistance programs to help these weak economies to evolve. And this applies not only to food, but to all of the other aspects of development, uh, industrial, uh, educational, uh, all different aspects. And uh, again, it comes back to looking for an easy way out. And it isn't easy. It's complex. Mm -hmm. and we have to deal with many different uh, aspects of development, food being only one of immediate importance. Beyond that, there are many others. And uh, if you tried to continue indefinitely to supply the food, which for some time to come might be possible if you uh, turned up the production capacity of, of the USA, Canada, Australia, Argentina, and USSR, and if these peoples uh, decided that they wanted to spread what was not needed there into the hungry nations of the world, it still wouldn't solve this problem of poverty in these nations. The countries themselves couldn't buy it on an international uh, market basis, and neither could the governments uh, buy it even at something much below and distribute it to their people. They too, the governments and the people are poor. And poverty is the basis of all of this basic trouble. Another question, do you believe that because we have an inexhaustible source of energy and atomic power that we have an unlimited license in population growth, or are we limited? Uh, I believe <coughs> that uh, we uh, are limited, that we cannot continue with an unlimited uh, population growth. Uh, however, we have already built into the system uh, 
a rather substantial population growth between uh, now and the year 2000, say, and there are those who worry about whether we can even uh, uh, handle that from the standpoint of energy and resources. And I think we can through the proper development of all our energy uh, uh, sources and the proper use of our natural resources. I'm sure some of the others may have something to say on this. What, what do you mean, sir, with the proper use of all our enemy en energy resources? Recycle. <coughs> How about the oil and the coal, I gas? Think, uh, uh, yes. Uh, well, we probably will also, uh, in my view, require a the development of a national energy policy sometime in the future whereby we will no longer be just burning our oil, those precious hydrocarbons that it's taken millions of years for nature to lay down uh, just to get the heat of the fire in order to generate electricity. We're going to have to at some stage begin to use these uh, hydrocarbons for their uh, 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 irreplaceable value in producing chemicals well, now with, as an with, example. With your experience uh, of the pace from which uh, the perception of a problem to the arrival and achievement of some legislation to control it, you have a wide experience of the, of the snail's pace at which that operates. Uh, what confidence have you that uh, the government can move faster than the oil pump? That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> uh, for instance, you talk about science and technology, and I, I share great confidence in this. But what I'm worried about is the is the is the uh, the terrible disposition of men out of their sheer concupiscence to serve themselves in the face of the facts. Now we have known for 50 years that Manhattan, in the, the weight of development, would become virtually uninhabitable and they still build a Pan Am building when you can't get down to go to lunch. Uh, they build a John Hancock on North Michigan Boulevard and ruin a beautiful street and add 20,000 more people to a single half square mile there. Uh, I mean, we are such damn fools in front of the facts. Mm -hmm. Now, that what are you going to do via science and technology to sensitize men and give them the kind of vision whereby they will even serve themselves rationally? Well, of course, you can't uh, solve the problem that you've identified with respect to the burgeoning uh, of buildings in New York through science. Well, we did identify it long ago. Yes, uh, but you can't solve that through science and technology per se. People have... Uh, That's uh, my point. Have to... <laughs> 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 We no. just curious yeah. through taxing and whatnot, we can disperse this, can't we? That's right. You have to direct your science and technology in that case. Uh, who? Who will direct it? The, well, the people and the government. And uh, from whom will they take their signal? Oh, from whom will the people take their signal? In the government. Well, they, I would hope the government will take their signal from the people. The people. Mm -hmm. and, and the um, government, uh, generally in the large part, reflects uh, what the people want, you know, yeah, or what they de uh, they're getting another. what they deserve in the in the democratic form, pretty largely. <laughs> if they're if they're uh, if they're have too much apathy, well, this is another issue. Okay. And we take our signals from one another, and the clearest signal I get is that I want to end up with more than you've got. Not necessarily. I don't believe that you're Which that kind of a Which is a very bad signal. <laughs> <laughs> and if that, was your, if that was your benchmark, you'd be badly disappointed. Well, that's... <laughs> well, I just want to make the observation that some of the apathy, or whatever you want, ho however you want to describe it, that has made possible some of the excesses that you uh, uh, describe using New York as an example, is uh, being uh, very rapidly overcome in just the uh, last uh, few years <coughs> because of the interest of the, the young people in their uh, uh, future. Would you specify, sir? I, I'm anxious to hear about this. Well, the, uh, the whole movement toward... Uh, uh, 
arresting the uh, uh, mistreatment of the environment. I think that's a, as good an example as uh, one can uh, imagine. This uh, idea that there are, are <coughs> 260 books uh, in one little bookstore in Washington directed toward this, but more than that, that there are so many actions at the national uh, level. Uh, the creation of the Environmental uh, Protection Agency, the new uh, NOAA, the uh, Oceanographic uh, uh, Agency. I fully expect that on the national level, within the next few years, there will be the creation of a National Energy Agency, for example, to uh, uh, take care of this uh, <coughs> balance between the proper use of oil and coal, the fossil fuels, nuclear energy, and so forth. Things are moving at a faster pace in those areas uh, within the last few years, uh, I assure you. Doesn't it seem um, possible, excuse me, that uh, with certain kinds of legislation, if we are really one country or even if we are one state, there can be legislation adapted that will tend to uh, correct some of these things such as building more and more buildings higher and higher and concentrating more and more people in, in restricted areas. What about uh, tax uh, incentives to, to spread this? Of course, you get more problems with transportation. But the same thing goes back to population. As long as we have the legislation the way it's stacked now, where you get a better, a bigger write-off, and, and I know this place will probably explode when I say this, uh, where you get more deductions for more children, uh, and then uh, at the same time we talk out the other side of our mouth that the developing nations uh, shouldn't be having so many children. How does this all add up? Have we ever faced up to this sort of thing? You're putting a premium on something that, you, that uh, now many people are talking against in the tax, tax structure. This will change. I have no doubts about it. But it changes very slowly. Well, here's a real one. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that the others haven't been real. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> but I'm anxious to see what my fellow uh, panelists have to say about this. In light of the fact that there is so much to do on Earth, should we continue to explore space? Anyone want to try that? <coughs> well, I'll start it off. I think we should. I go along with you. Oh, well, I don't. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> we got onto that point this morning that in oh, terms of managing the Earth, mm -hmm. really, the spin off mm -hmm. from the space exploration has, you know, on the one hand, been Earth resources satellites, mm -hmm. which enable us to control the kinds of problems we're talking about. If you want to make large-scale ecological surveys, which are not possible at the scale and magnitude and speed with which you want to make them on the ground, you seemingly with <coughs> spontaneity invent the kind of tool that does it outside of the Earth's atmosphere. You can photograph the changes in vegetation. Mm -hmm. Eventually, probably with linkage to the ground, so you can control the flow of water to crops, the flow of insecticides, this sort mm -hmm. of thing. I think that's probably the most important kind of spin-off. Mm -hmm. Tony will now disagree with me. Yes. We've got that fixed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think that's a valid argument for the space program at all. Uh, because if you want any of the benefits which have come from any of the spin-offs, it's quite evident that you could have gotten those benefits much more cheaply by, by aiming for them directly. So what the, the, way, the only way you can do this accounting is to consider a spin-off as a way of, redu of a way of reducing the costs of the enterprise. It's not the payoff, because it's much less uh, in any case than the total cost. Now, having said that, uh, I still think we ought to pursue the space program, but for a, a different reason. Let's go back to the, to, the, to the point that many people make. If we can put a man on the moon, why can't we clean up our cities? And um, you know, at first glance, that may seem like a sensible question. At second glance, it, it seems to be nonsense because there are entirely different kinds of enterprises. Putting a man on the moon is a large-scale organization of technology. It's the kind of thing we're good at <coughs> in this society. 
cleaning up our cities is not going to be done by putting together uh, hundreds of thousands of aerospace technicians uh, and performing um, uh, uh, systems analyses and inventing hardware uh, to deal with the problems of the cities. The problems of the cities are psychological, economic, moral, uh, aesthetic, and they're not likely to yield uh, to, to teams of, of people from, um, from Grumman and Boeing, uh, although Grumman and Boeing will disagree. Um, however, let's take a third look at that statement because it seems to me there's yet another level at which it makes sense again, although not in the naive form in which it's usually put. And that is, why aren't we the kind of society that cares enough to find out how you do things like clean up the city, even though you don't do them uh, with aerospace companies. So it isn't if we can do a great, impressive thing, you know, why can't we do this other thing that we need <coughs> even more? All right, now having said that, I think we have a misallocation of priorities in the society. It doesn't follow that we should cancel the space program just because there are other priorities in our society which are more important and which deserve our caring more than the space program did. You can't put all your efforts into your first priority thing. You know, your first priority is to breathe. That doesn't mean that you, that you cease to care about many, many other things. The space program is a very interesting uh, adventure. It has all kinds of, uh, of uh, satisfactions for people in it, satisfactions of, of curiosity, uh, wish for adventure, uh, the need to know more about the universe, uh, the need to do big things, and so forth. And it does big things in a way that does relatively little harm compared to all kinds of big things that might be done on Earth. So I think, on the whole, it's a, it's a laudable romantic enterprise. It doesn't mean it ought to be first priority. certainly doesn't mean we can justify it because we got an Earth satellite out of it. I like to uh, <laughs> use, make an illustration out of, out of what Mr. Wiener said. That is, the qualitative difference in the enterprise uh, is a way of making the same point I was trying to make a moment ago. I think really it's, it's, it's really much easier to put a man on the moon than to clean up the city because the moon does not exercise as over against the problem the same recalcitrance that people do. Uh, it's much harder, it's much harder really to train my children after having my three older boys having sat up all night having a big talk of how terrible the environment is to end their beer blast by throwing the cans on 57th Street, <laughs> uh, which is exactly what you do on this campus. Uh, you gripe about the establishment, the old square-headed establishment that planted beautiful lawns, and you get through a griping station and go out and throw crud all over them. Sure, you do. So this is the, <laughs> that is the problem of the, the interior formation of the sensibility toward one's relationship to the world. This is not a piece of engineering. It is a problem of a quite different character. And when we say, use the, the, old, cliche, the old statement, put a man on the moon, why can't we clean up Chicago? As the Germans say, es klingt so wunderlich. It just sounds fine, but it's a totally different problem. And it's a much more recalcitrant and delicate than long-term problem. And Grumman has the slightest idea what it's about, I think. Uh, that is, the methodologies appropriate to one are not the same. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of rhetoric to the effect that a big technological activity is somehow not human, that we ought to return to human concerns. Well, I'm not aware of any, any uh, creature other than humans that's capable of a big technological activity. And I think that people enjoy it uh, and that it, the results are impressive even when they're not useful. And I think if we could focus on the, some of the non-useful but impressive technological activities like the exploration of space, uh, these are, are worthwhile for their own sake. Oh, this is a, as bad a time as any to stop. Uh, <laughs> we'll uh, re resume this uh, at 3.30. We're recessed until 3.30.